Okay, thank you, Daryl. Can you hear me in the back? Yes? Okay. Well, today I'm going to talk about external uh, beam photon dose calculations. And I do have to have a, a financial disclosure under University of Wisconsin rules. I, I am a, a founder, a, a founder and a chairman of the board of tomotherapy. I'd like to acknowledge a, a, a large number of people uh, who, who have uh, uh, either uh, loaned or I've stolen slides from. Um, and let me start by uh, just framing out, I guess, historical uh, dose calculations. We're really talking about uh, uh, types of calculations that you have to use a computer for. So this is, these aren't hand calculations. And really the correction-based dose calculation models that existed really up until the, the mid-90s were essentially based on, 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 on calculations that evolved from hand calculations. So they're really based on measured dose distributions in a water phantom. And you then had independent corrections for the beam modifiers, um, for example, wedges and compensators, for surface contours, uh, and for tissues uh, within the body. And they're really based on effective spatial measures such as uh, uh, the depth in the field, the field boundary, and, and, and path lengths. And uh, the heterogeneity corrections uh, that they produced uh, weren't that accurate, especially if you had uh, both contour corrections, you had field modifiers, and you had serious uh, uh, heterogeneity issues. So really, uh, from the 90s, uh, we started having what are, are called now model-based dose calculations. So rather than starting from a measured uh, dose distribution, you still need that measured uh, water phantom data in order to characterize the models. But so you're creating uh, models rather than using the, the actual dose distributions themselves. So you're creating the dose distributions. And so the uh, ex uh, examples are the convolution superposition, uh, the finite pencil beam, and Monte Carlo uh, methods would all be considered as model-based. And so you're trying to, to directly go to a dose in the patient representation. And in fact, you're using the patient representation from CT uh, to get both the, the contour of the patient as well as the, as well as the tissue type and density. And model-based dose calculations are really uh, using um, uh, beam intensity uh, uh, using energy fluence uh, rather than dose in the phantom. So, so I'll discuss at the end. Really, these, these, these algorithms fundamentally have a kind of a different monitor unit calculations, different than hand calculations. Uh, but the most important thing is the beam has to be explicitly modeled. If you don't put uh, something into the model, it's not going to exist in the model. So, for example, you need uh, a finite source size. You don't have a point source. You need to incorporate the angular distribution of photons, the primary transmission, not just through the patient, but al also through anything that you put in the beam. Uh, extra focal radiation, uh, mainly from the primary collimator uh, and the flattening filter. But if you have a wedge in the beam, that also produces extra focal radiation. Uh, differential hardening of the beam by the field flattening filter and or by the wedge. Uh, the issue of curved uh, leaf ends if they exist. Um, and in general, the leaf configuration. The tongue and groove effect, uh, leaf transmission, electron contamination, and of course the patient. So you can see that most of the issues um, uh, are involving the beam before it even hits the patient. The actual calculation uh, in the patient uh, is actually relatively uh, simple. It's preparing the beam for the calculation to the patient that takes all of the modeling effort. And again, if it ain't modeled, it ain't there. So let's take a look at modeling the head of a, of a modern accelerator. So you have a, a target, and uh, the photons then are created by uh, electrons striking the target. And in fact, we don't know what really the width of the electron beam is, so that's a parameter that has a great influence then um, on, the, uh, on the distribution of angular, sorry, the uh, lateral di distribution of photons that are coming from the target, the penumbra, is, is, uh, is partially then due to the, the size of that electron beam. You have extra focal radiation coming from the, the, the primary uh, col collimator, from the field flattening filter. And then uh, you have uh, effects of jaws. In fact, one of the subtle effects of jaws is if you have the jaws closed, then you get backscatter into the monitor chamber that can result actually in a few percent uh, perturbation in the output factor. 
Um, and then if, if, if you like, you can measure the output uh, in, in a uh, mini phantom or a so-called so in-air uh, phantom here that, uh, that is looking at something that's close to the primary beam. But what do we really mean by primary beam? Uh, we, uh, we have direct radiation that's coming straight from the target um, as well as a radiation that's coming from various components, the extra focal source. Uh, I'll talk about this later, but, but clearly uh, if you want to model it, you have to know what the contribution of each of these sources are. So there's issues with the, uh, with the leaf uh, uh, shape. So the rounded leaf, leaf edges are, are going to produce uh, a widened uh, penumbra. Um, obviously the light field is stopped by the edge of it here. Um, but really the 50% um, uh, point on the penumbra is really governed by some ray that's traveling through the, uh, side, the uh, side of the collimator. So, in fact, uh, in the dawn of uh, IMRT, a big problem with just incorporating conventional models was taking into account this, this uh, rounded leaf. And, and I think uh, currently clinical treatment planning systems are doing a much better job of this. Um, Model-based methods are really needed for IMRT. I don't think you should have IMRT without a model-based system. Um, and really the reason for that is IMRT is the summation of small fields. So fundamentally you're dealing with small fields. And so it's a, it's a function of penumbra, leakage, and, and the head scatter. And in fact, what's happening when you add up a whole bunch of small fields is you're adding up a whole bunch of penumbras. You're adding up a whole bunch of transmissions as well as the primary field. And you need really an accurate treatment head model in order to get this right. And again, just as an example, you know, IMRT really is about adding up these very complicated shaped, shaped fields, uh, some of them extremely small, stereotactic-like fields sometimes. And just as shows you classically, if you, if you go back to the original hand calculation-based methods of trying to separate out uh, phantom scatter um, from um, from a um, um, from a you know a tissue maximum ratio, for example. Then you always extrapolated from some larger field size, and you were pretending for the moment that this was the primary contribution, and this was the scatter contribution. Well, in fact, if you go to very much smaller si uh, size fields, this continues to drop the phantom scatter factor, uh, and this really is the range that IMRT is important. So this worked well for conventional 3D conformal, but not for IMRT. So you really need to extend the beam model in some way from this you know, classical 4x4 four four and above to something that's very small. You need, need to be able to characterize very small field sizes. In fact, I would even say characterize field sizes that are even smaller than stereotactic radio surgery some, sometimes. And it's difficult. Small field data is hard to get. So there's, uh, direct measurement uh, is challenging. Still, uh, still have lots of uncertainty involved in trying to measure the dose in small fields. Extrapolation of, uh, of existing data has, has to assume some underlying physical model. And then verifying some uh, golden model and getting the parameters is, is, a, is a newer approach. Any case will have uncertainty and, and really it's, it, you need to evaluate its impact in the clinical IMRT distribution generated by the inverse planning system. So, for example, what are the reasons for the drop in output with small field size? Well, one of them, as I mentioned already, is a backscatter into the monitor unit chamber, uh, into the monitor chamber from uh, the beam uh, defining jaws. Uh, it's, of course, some reduced scatter, uh, both from the phantom uh, scatter and, and coming from the head directly. Electronic disequilibrium uh, is also true, but really the major effect is obscuration of the source as you get down to IMRT size. You're actually seeing a smaller portion of the source, because the source, in, in effect, is a, is a broad few millimeter size object. I think it's important to emphasize that we would like dose computation to be a, what I call, linear system. And what do we mean by a linear system? Well, one that can be described by a, uh, by a matrix uh, multiply. So, for example, if we want the dose at point one, uh, then we would have to take into account all of the weights of pencil beams uh, from all possible beams that could supply dose to point one, and the same for, for point, point two. So in, in fact, if you can ignore for the moment leakage um, from the head of the machine, then it, it's a, it's a uh, linear system, and, and so linear algebra can be used. 
Let's take a look at, of course, um, at one of the um, uh, big success stories in, in a, if you like, a linear systems approach is, is, is pencil beam con convolution. So you can model, uh, if you like, the total energy removed per unit mass, the terma. And just to remind you, uh, terma is, um, is the, um, is the um, uh, mass attenuation co coefficient times the, uh, times the energy fluence. Uh, multiplied with a kernel that represents a single pencil beam. So a convolution of this with this in a homogeneous phantom will give you a, a dose distribution. And so if you like, uh, this is the pencil beam kernel describing the dose in fully, uh, the pencil beam dose in 3D, uh, and this is the energy fluence uh, uh, incident on the patient. Should actually be a mu over rho times out there at the front. Uh, pencil beams generated for homogeneous uh, water is a fast way to do the calculation, um, especially for iterative optimization calculations. In optimization, you have to repeat the calculation multiple times, so it's nice to have a fast calculation that will do that. Um, and the importance of speed grows if you have more beam directions or finer resolution or if you want to have uh, a, lot more, a lot more iterations. And often it's good for the early phases of iteration. Uh, but you need to do a more accurate calculation for the last iteration and final dose calculation. And what's really the problem with pre-computed pencil beams? I'll give you an example here in uh, breast radiation therapy. What you're assuming effectively then is, is um, at the edge of a phantom uh, or, sorry, at the edge of the phantom or in the center of the phantom, you're taking into account, you're assuming that this is an equilibrium uh, scattering environment and more sophisticated models are at least able to take into account the, the impact of first scatter, uh, which is the majority of scatter in this situation. So a, a finite pencil beam algorithm does a very bad job, for example, uh, on these tangential fields at the edge of breast. A convolution equation, a full 3D convolution equation, um, here you see with the mu, mu over rho uh, properly in the equation, so mu over rho times the energy fluence is, is, the, uh, is the terma. So the terma uh, convolved then with a 3D uh, kernel, not just, not a uh, pencil beam, but a kernel that represents where the dose is going when photons interact at a single point. So if you like a 3D kernel. Uh, this then um, allows you to calculate the dose by a varying intensity beam um, in a homogeneous phantom. So this is, still re uh, this is still assuming that you have a homogeneous phantom. So one, one way of looking at this is you have a dose deposition site and you're looking up and seeing where um, all the primary photon interaction sites uh, are that are supplying uh, energy to this uh, dose deposition sites. And it's basically a summation over all possible rays, um, uh, all possible primary interaction sites. And that's really what this equation is, is describing. And you have to do such things as in include, uh, take into account hardening. This is exactly true for a monoenergetic beam. One way to take into account hardening is to add terms for each, each bin in the, in the spectrum. So, uh, so a graphical representation of, uh, uh, of convolution is imagine you have this is the, is the primary energy fluence distribution or the term of distribution. And here you have a central block and, and perfectly uh, a, a very small source so the penumbra is very sharp. If you convolve this with a kernel that represents dose uh, uh, or a secondary dose when primary photons interact here, then in effect this is a blurring function. So you take this, uh, convolve it with this, and you get then all of the major features, including buildup. Uh, you get uh, penumbra blurring at least due to the uh, electron transport and secondarily due to photon scatter, and you then have a more realistic dose distribution. So the kernels are important things to, uh, to know, at least especially in, in calculating the dose in the penumbra and the, and the buildup re region. And so here's two, two examples of ker kernel sets, one that we computed a long time ago and, 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 and the set that Chewy and Mohan computed, essentially showing that there was agreement. These were Monte Carlo derived do dose calculations. This is a function of, uh, this is a for in the forward direction off, uh, and uh, this, these, these are um, bins then showing uh, higher degrees of scatter. So clearly the kernels uh, in the forward direction are much more important and even more so uh, as you go up in energy. So forward directed photons become much more important as the beam energy gets higher. Uh, 
And this, and, and this is what you can do if, as, you, as you then integrate o over a spherical shells, you can see that um, uh, at a, a relatively high energy beam, uh, uh, w sorry, this is a relatively high energy beam, this is a relatively low energy beam, that, um, that the primary uh, builds up here and the amount of scatter is relatively small. Um, and in a low energy beam, um, then you have much higher uh, proportion of scatter. This, by the way, is a log, a log curve here. So, so clearly, as you have a, a relatively large radius, you have a much higher proportion of scatter at low energy. Um, and so this is all, all also showing this in a, in a different way. Uh, so this is a, a kernel at a, um, a uh, half an MeV, a kernel at 50 MeV, so the two kind of extremes that you need to potentially deal, deal with in external beam photons. And you can see here low energy scatter is a very large proportion of, of, the, uh, of the dose and, build, and builds up um, uh, after a few centimeters depth. And you can see at high energy it's a very extremely small proportion and, and the primary. But here you see that there's very little build up curve, uh, almost negligible, and here there's a tremendously deep build up curve uh, in the depth dose behavior. So, uh, so one of the things that, that one, uh, one does in order to uh, determine what the spectra is is to determine um, what the depth dose pattern is um, in water. And so depth dose uh, measurements are used to infer what the spectrum must be. But one of the potential problems is you can change the spectra a whole lot. So here's two different spectra, quite different spectra. They generally have the right trend. Uh, they have a, a peak at about a half an MeV. And then, of course, uh, they, they have a maximum um, near where, where the MVH uh, is. But here, this, they're, they're quite different, and yet they produce essentially identical depth dose curves. So in fact, it's quite forgiving. You can have widely varying spectrum, and it produces relatively unchanged uh, depth dose behavior. I showed this uh, earlier, but I'd like to explain it a bit now. So this is the relative particle uh, count, if you like, or proportion of particles uh, coming directly from the target. It's about 85% it's about uh, come from directly from the target without interacting in the machine. This is for a, uh, for a uh, 10 by 10 field. The primary collimator uh, produces about 4% and the flattening filter about 10%. So about 15% uh, of the particles finding themselves at the central axis for a 10 by 10 field. Um, uh, the majority is uh, direct from the target, but in order to get it right, you're going to have to somehow take into account the effects uh, of the flattening filter and the primary collimator as extra focal sources. And um, if we focus in a bit on the flattening filter, the scatter fraction from the flattening filter depends on the energy. So low energy beams uh, are actually producing far less uh, scatter. This is a, as a function of, of radius or lateral position uh, than, than, the, than the high energy part of, uh, than a high energy beam. Um, and of course, it depends on the on the target ma material, which uh, which these are the two two extremes. It tends to be uh, for most of these energies now just uh, steel, but it, but you get to see that low energy is is actually um, somewhat better in, in in terms of creating scatter uh, as compared to high energy. And that's because some of the scatter just doesn't make it out of the head of the machine. It's relatively wide angle scatter at low energy. Here's, a, here's the fluence uh, as a function of radius, and the fluence is not flat. So the fluence coming out of an accelerator has horns. So it has off-axis horns that have to be modeled in the planning system. Um, and in fact, the, uh, the, the primary collimator has, has a roughly a, a similar trend. The flattening filter, interestingly, has fluence uh, dependence that falls off. And the reason for that is, is it's peaked at the center, and it generally is forward directed. and so. Its, its kind of uh, influence is somewhat uh, shaped to its, to its um, uh, thickness. This, though, is, is the mean energy, okay? So, so, um, so the, uh, the uh, photons that are coming uh, directly from the target uh, as a function of radius from the central axis have a, have a much higher energy. Uh, in fact, here, almost 50% higher energy. And this, is, and this is, of course, because of the flattening filter is hardening the beam along the central axis as opposed to the edge. And so this, of course, has to be taken into account in order to get a dose distribution even close to being right. Um, and, and, and this is the mean energy. For, this is a, a 6 MV electron. And this is showing that, the, again, the this, this similar thing. So, so clearly the, 
the center of the beam is much higher energy than the edge of the beam. And then outside of the field, it's just scattered uh, pho photons. Again, most of these are from the flattening filter. Uh, and so that you have a, 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 di a, discon a discontinuous then uh, mean energy outside the field. In fact, tomotherapy doesn't have a field flattening filter, and so one of its characteristics is, is, is almost independently as a function of uh, position uh, laterally, the spectrum is nearly identical, uh, and this is a, a, log, a, a log linear uh, curve just to show that as well. But, uh, it does have, it does have um, an intensity uh, peak in the center, but its, its mean energy is essentially invariant. So one has to uh, model the energy fluence from, uh, from measurements in air, or at least what you'd like to assume are measurements in air. Or, or you have to infer uh, what the uh, measurements would be if they were measured in air. And so if you do that, you see that you, have, you would go and measure, uh, you clearly see the horns. Uh, you obviously see that the uh, absolute in, uh, dose in air is higher uh, because of the contribution of extra focal radiation that's able to make it through uh, the, the, uh, the uh, collimation system. Well, the kernels themselves are, are assumed, uh, are, can be assumed to be uh, invariant. So in other words, the same kernel at, at uh, deeper depths uh, can be used a, as in shallower depths. Uh, and if you do that, you will find that you will make a few percent error. So you actually have to have some algorithm for hardening, hardening the kernel. So this is what the real Monte Carlo results would be, and this is a, a hardening correction. And this is if you don't do uh, ker kernel hardening. So, so at deep depths, then, you can be wrong by, by, by many percent if that weren't taken into account. Uh, this is, uh, this is uh, uh, essentially what you do in order to verify that you're starting to model the beam right. You compare measurement with the prediction. Here, this is a, a tool that's now in all treatment planning systems, just ha happened to show it from the, from, uh, from the uh, Phillips Pinnacle model, um, is that you get a, a, the ability to compare your, your depth dose uh, measurements with what the uh, model says it is. And that's how you would uh, verify your commissioning model. And this is a, another example, happens to be from tomotherapy, uh, showing what the experiment versus the model, the model is. Uh, this, by the way, is, a, uh, a, again, a, another comparison that you would have to do to make sure that the measurements that you have, have done and the model that you've assigned uh, are, are correct. This is a, a tomotherapy uh, prof, uh, set of profiles. And here you see the effect of not having a field flattening filter is you have an on-flat uh, field. In this case, it doesn't matter because you can flatten it by modulating it flat. Uh, and as I said, it does have the advantage that, um, that you have the spectrums invariant as a function of position, and so it's easier to model. And you also, can, if the field is small, you get, get to use all of this extra intensity, and you could then mo modula uh, modulate it flat up there instead of essentially starting with the field being flat at a wide, at a wide area. This happens to be the profile in the other direction, just to show that a comparison between measurement and, mod and, and, uh, and the model. Well, I haven't really talked about if the patient isn't a homogeneous water phantom, and there you have to use a superposition calculation. And so what you're essentially doing in so-called superposition is you're, you are taking into account um, the, uh, the path length from the, from the primary photon interaction site to the dose deposition site. So you're taking into account then the primary photon interacted here. You're, you're taking into account that, that at this dose deposition site, it's gone through material other than, uh, other than water. And so uh, and how we deal with this is by kernel scaling or kernel stretching. So, so but the assumptions are is that, is that you are making the assumption that this first scattered photon path from the primary photon interaction site to the dose deposition site is the characteristic for all, all other orders of, of uh, scatter. So it, it does correctly account for perturbation in first scatter, which, which does domin is dominant, uh, and it's not a bad approximation for the electron set in motion from this point as well, the so-called primary dose, but the approximation gets worse for second and higher order scatter. So what you really do in kernel stretching is if, if this were a uh, phantom in which you didn't have any kernel stretching, 
this would be one in which this, this kernel is stretched. And clearly in this low density material, then the kernel gets stretched in this direction because uh, both the scattered photons and the electrons and positrons set in motion travel longer distances. The mean free path is longer as well as the electron range. And so it's possible to take into uh, account each of, uh, or a bunch of effects. This is the, this is a heterogeneous dose calculation. This is probably the closest to the truth. It takes into account uh, the fact that there's a surface contour, that the, the primary photons are passing through materials of different density. And the characteristic here, if you look at the penumbra, you get penumbra broadening here. So you look at this, this, this green line is contracting in and this red line is bulging out. And so that the penumbra is growing in this, in this lung material. This, this one, um, you're taking into account um, the, uh, the fact that you're doing the primary calculation correctly, but the uh, secondary, in other words, the kernel isn't being modified at all. So this would be uh, like a convolution calculation here. And notice that the penumbra isn't blurring here. This one is the, wor is the worst of the assumptions. This is only taking into account surface corrections and it ma makes the assumption that the primary photons are just going through water. So you can see here that, um, that, that here this is, taken, this is taking into account the primary photon path. This one isn't. This is only taking into account the, uh, the surface contour. Well, one of the things, if you're just stretching it along, along one, one, one path, it's not the true kernel. That, the true kernel should be something that you, in principle, could, could calculate. And this is from a nice, a nice paper that actually did calculate a kernel for this, this kind of... Uh, kind of a bit of a wild situation. You have water, this big air cavity in here. And so um, you can see that the kernel calculation agrees very, very well up in here, but starts to disagree once you're into air and, and past. And you could look at this and say, you know, it's not doing a very good job. But in fact, you're adding up so many of these kernel calculations, all of these uh, perturbations get blurred out uh, in reality. So it turns out that while each individual pencil beam calculation is not very good, Anytime you do have a, a, a larger field size, it works pretty well. And this is a superposition re result that, that shows a water phantom cork mimicking lung here. And this is a, a comparison of measurement um, and Monte Carlo. Uh, and you can see that it does a nice job of simulating the results uh, uh, fairly correctly. Uh, and uh, one of the interesting things is you go to small fields, of course, you can get some huge perturbations. This is a one-by-one one field, and you can see that as, as compared to, this is a, I can hardly read it from here, five-by-five five field. And so um, uh, you, uh, you can see that uh, very, very, very easily that um, you get huge perturbations as you go to smaller fields um, uh, because of uh, heterogeneity corrections. And this is a and this is a, a work that was that that ho showed a bunch of results for very very tiny fields. This is a field diameter, a point one. So this is a, a millimeter diameter field, uh, up to 12 centimeters di diameter field in this phantom that that contained a, a large number of material types. So so you can see that you can have quite uh, uh, different dose uh, calculations depending upon the the area of the field because of uh, disequilibrium effects. One of the things that you have to include in the model is, uh, is electron contamination for, for, for photon beams. And this is some, some, a, a way of, of actually determining what the electron contamination really is. So you have a magnet that sweeps out the electron contamination from the field, so you can actually make some measurements on that. And so this is what a buildup curve, if we go to the shallow depths, this is a buildup curve at 24 MV uh, with and without the magnet being turned on. So as you, as you turn on the magnet, the, uh, the uh, magnet, the sur you can see the surface dose drops a lot um, uh, because, of course, electron contamination is mainly at the, at the surface. But by taking differences between these, these curves, you can infer what the depth dose characteristic of the contamination is. And so if you go and look at the, the normalized surface dose here, you see that what is, is actually the worst contamination is coming from high, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the highest en energy beam, a 24 MV beam, has a great deal of, uh, of surface dose. Uh, by the way, uh, this is with the magnet fully on here. So this is a function of magnet strength. So you can see that we haven't even, qu even quite reached all of the sweeping capability of the magnet. But this is generally photon backscatter, and this is electron contamination components. 
And so then you can uh, uh, analyze what the depth dose be behavior is. This is a 6 MV beam, and this is an absolute curve then. So this is 6 MV beam has a lot less contamination than, for example, a 24 MV beam. And, and why is that? Well, at high energies, the electrons are traveling much more in the forward direction and cause a lot more electron contamination. And so it's uh, in treatment planning models, this happens to be from, uh, from a pinnacle, then have a complicated model of showing the depth effect. This is a approximate electron, uh, sorry, exponential decay uh, with, with some modification of that. There's some effect off axis because the electrons are like a Gaussian uh, pencil beam. Um, and then there's a field size effect that generally shows it's generally linear with field size electron contamination. And so there's various parameters that you can model. But, if, but you must, must do this if you expect to get the, the, uh, the dose near the surface right. And you'll see the effect um, uh, at shallow depths just outside the field, uh, even more importantly. So, uh, so uh, I know pinnacle best and, uh, uh, in, in, in terms of a general do a dose calculation system. And so this is how it models the beam. So you first model the incident fluence as, as it exits the, uh, the LINAC head. You project this fluence through the density representation of the patient uh, and compute the terma, and then you have a 3D convolution a superposition calculation, uh, taking the terma and doing a, uh, a, a point kernel ray tracing, and at the end you add the electron contamination to it. Let me talk a little bit about Monte Carlo calculation. Here we explicitly transport the individual photons through the, the, the head and the patient. You really need to do the head as well. Uh, and so the geometry and the radiation physics really is the model. And so there's lots of ways of doing this. Eggs is probably the one that's the, uh, that's the best known. Um, and you can buy now clinical treatment planning systems, for example, Monaco from, uh, from CMS. But let's take a look at uh, differences between Monte Carlo and superposition calculations. And uh, you can see here that, uh, that this is Monte Carlo, this is superposition. Um, and if we compare these two back-to-back uh, -back or side-to-side, -side, then you can see that you, um, if we um, uh, look, look at um, the, the uh, fractional volume in the target product accord, you can see that you're pretty much within plus or minus 5% per, per, percent, uh, in, this, in this calculation. If we go and do the same thing in lung, we're probably a little bit better. There's probably an error a shift of a couple per percent uh, incorrect, and there's probably a slightly smaller uh, width uh, for this lung case. So you can nearly guarantee that you're within five per plus or minus 5% in a convolution calculation, even for these relatively complicated situations with convolution superposition. But clearly, Monte Carlo uh, will give you that extra accuracy. Uh, one of the things that you also have to worry, have to worry about in, in um, intensely modulated radiation therapy is that uh, you, you get what's called convergence error. So if you use a simple model like the pencil beam uh, or convolution superposition as compared to, to the Monte Carlo, which we think is the most accurate, then, then these will actually be converging to the wrong fluence pattern that you want be, because of the dose calculation error implicitly and not, and not getting uh, calculation right. And in, in fact, uh, uh, the convolution super, uh, superposition will, will have uh, some degree of error than due to this uh, convergence error, which is actually quite a bit worse uh, than the systematic error. And a, a calculation like the pencil beam is, is even worse. One of the things that's implicit uh, and, and you rarely hear, hear talk about, everybody learns when they uh, take a medical physics program about how to do monitor calculations, uh, for hand calculations, but no one ever really finds out how it's being done on the computer. And, and in fact, this is how, it, how it's done. Uh, what you do is, well, for all monitor unit calculations can be boiled down to getting the prescribed dose and then dividing it by the dose per monitor unit. Um, and you can get the dose per monitor unit by directly computing the dose per energy fluence and then uh, calibrating the beam in terms of energy fluence per monitor unit. And so this is really the way that, uh, that uh, model-based systems are doing monitor unit calculations, calculating this, and then using uh, the beam output as described in terms of energy fluence per monitor unit. Now, how do you get this data? 
Well, this data is found by uh, uh, the energy fluence per monarch unit is found by a ratio of, of, of measurement uh, of dose per monarch unit in a reference condition divided by dose per energy fluence from your calculation system and, and, and dividing this by this gives you energy fluence per monarch unit. And so essentially taking your reference conditions and both measuring it and uh, simulating it allow you to get this, uh, this, this number. You can do more than just the patient itself. In fact, we, uh, this is some very old work, but it's still relevant. You can actually go calculate the dose down in here, a portal imaging system behind the patient, and take into account the scatter and electron tra transport uh, perturbation, or uh, uh, a, a scatter, electron uh, tra transport and scattering and perturbation of the primary fluence from your patient back on the, on the phantom. And so this can be used for dose reconstruction as well. If you're, you're now modeling a system that's greater than the patient, includes the portal imaging device as well. So will Monte Carlo take over? Um, I think for few field IMRT Monte Carlo is slower than convolution superposition. But the, conv the computation time for Monte Carlo is nearly independent of the number of beam directions. In other words, you can take uh, all of those uh, uh, Mo uh, Monte Carlo simulation histories or simulated particles, and you can divide them up through all of the directions. And you can then have very relatively few particles per direction, and you get the same result at the end, or nearly the same result. So, so the more beams that you're actually using, the more, the more advantage there is in Monte Carlo uh, as compared to convolution superposition. But the Monte Carlo method is only slightly more accurate for photon beams. For very complicated cases, it's, it's clearly within our plus or minus 5% uh, that, that, the, uh, that the ICRU uh, wa wa wants us to be. Uh, it will be easier to take into account IMRT delivery geometries like, uh, like collimators with Monte Carlo, though. So I think Monte Carlos will take over. Summary then, the convolution method is a deterministic calculation that uses the results of Monte Carlo simulation. Today it's the main uh, model-based system that I think we need for IMRT, but, but beam uh, uh, characterization can be performed with Monte Carlo simulation. The superposition method is a variant of the convolution method and predicts dose within a few percent of Monte Carlo. Uh, and was about an order of magnitude faster for few fields, but it's about the same probably in, in dose calculation time for, for, for large numbers of fields. Uh, and the energy fluence calibration is more appropriate for model-based dose calculations, and treatment planning systems really have this model built into it now. Thank you very much.